Okay, so for week eight of fall anime, happy birthday, Sterk. My boy gets to celebrate his first birthday party. Andy goes Super Saiyan in Undead Unlock. Rest in peace to the Ice Bunny. Rest in peace to Jujutsu Kaisen. We also got another death there. And most of these other shows are escalating. So a lot of cool moments this week. Let's get started. Okay, so for Spy Family Season 2 Episode 8. What a banger episode. Yes, I know this anime is mainly slice of life, but sometimes they got the bangers. They got good storytelling. This one is your focus. Why is she still becoming an assassin? Does she want to live a happy life with her family? Does she want to keep supporting Yuri? Does she want to keep killing people for the sake of the government? Yor doesn't know, but yeah, she just doesn't want to die or get injured. It looks like her main priority is her family. And if she like suffers any major injury, injuries during these fights it's hard to explain maybe lloyd will divorce her and now her life will be sad so that's kind of like a big obstacle in this bodyguard fight because there's like a lot of like dangerous criminals so yeah this episode was solid because yeah a lot of like good your moments as well as like very crazy pop-off fights just had your fighting off a shit ton of assassins and it was pure comedy because none of their sneak attacks none of their abilities were able to affect your Maybe she gets graced a bit, gets a bit bruised, but she just brutally beats everyone up, murders them like so easily. So yeah, she rescues the mother and the fake husband, tries to put them down a hatch. The director is also like kind of helping, he's like sniping people up top. None of them are really a match for Yor, she's just, like stabbing all these dudes, kind of like making a mess. Her whole face and arms are bloody. They try to give us their backstories, but they are no match. We see there's like high level assassins that are actually really strong, so now Yor is kind of like on the back foot. There's like this dude with the sword that's like kind of beating up Yor, he kind of like knocks her out as well. So Yor is kind of shaky now because she doesn't know what she's gonna do but no she realizes that she wants to help people even if she helps one person she did her job so yeah any injury she suffers lloyd will forgive her so yeah that's an intense scene Yor kind of forgives herself and realizes what she's fighting for and then kind of overpowers the sword guy he kind of like stabs her in the midsection but Yor kind of kicks him in the face and she's ready she's ready to kill even more people this was an intense episode lots of emotions pouring out from Yor. i love them showing off the other characters in the middle of the fight as well because there's like a whole firework show going on on top of this boat as well and then everyone's just like laughing watching the fireworks anya and lloyd are having fun okay so for jujutsu kaisen season 2 episode 18 very sad episode yes this anime all the shibuya arc so much shit is happening bro people are dying last episode was so scary sakura and maharaga just destroying like the whole city and then yeah yuji kind of like seeing the destruction and everything so yes, Yuji can't catch a break. And yeah, this is the kind of expected Mahito fight, the one they were kind of like cooking up. Yuji really hates Mahito, Mahito hates Yuji. And yeah, Mahito is kind of like a good villain to square off against the main character because he's just like super evil, but he's also like kind of like chill, laid back, funny. So yeah, Yuji really hates how like he just plays with all these lives. And yeah, basically Mahito kills Nanami, <laughs> first and foremost. So yeah, we saw Nanami got burned by Jogo, but he's still alive. He kind of has like a two-face aesthetic going on. because <laughs> like half his upper body is burnt. So yeah, I mean, my man is tough. He's powering through it. And then yeah, he's kind of like walking through the train station. He wants to go to Malaysia he's kind of like dreaming like oh i'm walking into speech it's so relaxing i finally get my day off get my vacation so yeah we see like his button is down no tie he just seems so happy but yeah in the real world he's just like walking through the train station beating up on these transfigured humans the so, anatomy is kind of slashing them all up so even though he's injured he's like Still fighting. So yes, the animation was sick, kind of like showing Nanami relaxing in Malaysia, dancing on the beach, while also killing all these transfigured humans. And yeah, while he like beats them all up, Mahito shows up behind him, and now it's over. He blows up Nanami. But before that, Yuji comes in just to see. Yuji's so sad. And then Nanami, in his last words, he's like, you got it from here. So yeah, he sees Hivar kind of like tell him to like, you know, give some encouraging words to Yuji. Nanami doesn't want to say anything because he feels like anything he says might be a curse to Yuji, but he still does it. And then, yeah, he blows up. Mahito blows him up. <laughs> Another character dead. Like, what the hell? I went to Anime NYC uh, last week, and it was kind of crazy seeing all these, like, Nanami cosplayers. He's such a fan favorite character, and yeah, now it's over, bro. <laughs> but yeah, Yuji's so angry now. He doesn't have time to be sad or anything, so he's trying to fight Mahito. The problem is Mahito has so many transfigured humans, and as we know... Yuji struggles so much to kill these guys. He thinks they're still human, he doesn't want to murder them, and yeah, it's just like so sad seeing Mahito kind of toy with all these people's lives. So yeah, this fight was kind of insane. I really liked it, but also you can feel like it is a bit disjointed sometimes. Some moments I had problems with was like when Yuji went into an elevator randomly, 
and then he escaped the elevator randomly they didn't show like the transition but i mean the fight was still like directed very well but i guess they don't really have time i'm assuming so yeah a lot of extra stuff you can tell was kind of skipped but they did add a lot to the fight so yeah like mahito with the kiss he kind of summons a fake junpei clone on his hand to mock yuji as well so yeah a lot of like crazy fucked up shit by mahito but yuji is so cool all he knows is fighting all he knows is punching kicking martial arts so yeah he's just like punching mahito and the thing is his punches are very strong he can actually beat up Mahito's soul directly, so yeah, Mahito's trying to avoid him. So yeah, the fight goes on in this train station, very intense. Also, after that, we see Nobara, she is back. What is she doing here? Well, Mahito, we saw that he can split his body up into two parts. That's kind of insane, okay. What's worse than one Mahito, two Mahitos, I guess. So the second version is fighting Nobara. It looks like Nobara still has some moves. She has to redeem herself. So yeah, she kind of like drop kicks a sign in his face, which is pretty cool. She has her nails, she has her hairpin. Problem is, Mahito doesn't take any damage unless you hit his soul. So, so yeah, maybe this is a good matchup. We'll see. But yeah, it's Yuji versus Mahito and Nobara versus Mahito at the same time. That's kind of cool. Okay, so for Undead Unluck Episode 8, I'm not even shocked anymore. Every episode is just crazy. So yeah, here Andy kind of like goes up to outer space to fight Spoil. So how do we get here? First, we see Shen fighting off Spoil. So he has like this giant staff and then he's able to attack Spoil's head. He realizes that Spoil's area of decomposition is kind of attached to his body. So if you fight like outside of his radius, kind of like smack his head a little bit, then you're kind of like in a safe spot. And since Chen wants to be the strongest, he's kind of taking care of Spoil pretty well. The thing is, all their attacks seem to damage him, but they need a way to kind of like defeat him and also extract the core without killing him. So then Fuko realizes that, hey, what if we go to outer space because there's no bacteria there? So yeah, I guess that's the weakness. So yeah, Chen has like this uh, Uma weapon, which is kind of just like a long extending stick. So he uses it to knock both Spoil and Andy up into outer space. And then Andy is also participating in this plan but since spoils power is like really strong and he has to remove the limiter in his brain he did it in the first episode and he's doing it here so yeah it's kind of sick because it was something i didn't expect Andy just going super saiyan 4 just growing long black hair instead of gray hair he has like this whole new form new pants and his regeneration is like on another level you can't really damage him and he can also cut off pieces of his body and split literally make clones with this extra body parts but then yeah they disappear pretty quickly but yeah this just shows that Andy has so much in his arsenal that he's not even using like he's obviously physically strong he can fly around he has his parts bullet but now he can split up into multiple people and fight so yeah he kind of cuts up spoil so easily in outer space and he kind of like takes spoil's core cuts his arm off and throws his arm back down to earth while his like body kind of disappears i guess so yes now he's regenerating from this arm and then this new guy comes in so it's not andy anymore it's actually victor the god of victory. This is Andy's real identity. It's kind of weird. Maybe he has like some type of multiple personality because yeah, this doesn't seem like Andy at all. And then yeah, it looks like he's mad at Fuko for kind of like brainwashing, making Andy soft. And then he even makes fun of her because he's like, oh, your power isn't even strong enough to kill me. So yeah, what are you going to do? Like, how are you going to beat Andy? So yeah, Fuko's really sad. She also doesn't want to die. So she uses the talk no jutsu. But then the fight isn't over. Since Shen and Fuko really can't get through with Andy. And they can't really beat him in a fight either. They call the reinforcements, the rest of the round table, all the other union members coming in. I have really high expectations because, yes, we have like a very colorful cast of characters. We know none of their powers really, so yeah, I guess they're showing them off here now. And yeah, the woman who's number one, she also seems to be badass, so yeah, I wonder what she's gonna do. So it seems to be from the past where like all these rules and the apocalypse stuff didn't happen. And yeah, the story keeps popping off, a lot of interesting things are happening, and these characters are just using their powers, cool fights every episode. So for the Apothecary Diaries episode 8, we solve a murder-suicide case in this episode. Kind of unexpected, because yeah, Mau Mau gets to return back home to her village, but yeah, like stuff, people need her, they need the Apothecary. So instantly as she wakes up, she gets called in to like solve this case. Basically two people are dying, they got poisoned. So Mau Mau kind of like helps the CPR, it's like in this brothel. So one of the dudes, he's just not breathing. And then the consort girl, she's barely alive. So Mau Mau and another person both try to like save their lives through CPR and they do eventually save them. So yeah, Mau Mau realizes what the poison was. It is tobacco leaves. So yeah, apparently tobacco leaves are poisonous. I didn't know that. Like I knew they're bad for you if you smoke them, but apparently if you eat them, yeah, they're super dangerous, especially if you water it down as well. It's like a lethal poison. So Mau Mau and her dad get rewarded for saving these people's lives. And you know, it's all good, right? Mau Mau realizes that the dude she saved 
He's actually very hated. He's like a repeat customer that's like very scumbaggy. He kind of like leads women on. He's like, oh, I'll buy you. We can like have a relationship, start our life together. And he kind of just like ditches these girls. So yes, yeah, one of the girls, she has like a little sister. So she wanted revenge on him. So she actually tries to stab him. But then Mama kind of like fights her off and like headbutts her. And now she's like in the middle of it. So she kind of gets like the lore dump from one of the other consorts. And then they're like how bad this guy is. And then since he's really rich, they can't really do anything against him. And people tried to poison him before, but he still keeps coming in and he has bodyguards, so it's like really hard to kill him. So instead of this being a murder-suicide, it was actually just a murder. The girl was trying to like poison him and then she kind of like lightly poisoned herself so she wouldn't die. So I guess they'll kind of figure things out themselves. But yeah, this anime does this a lot, just like showing you a lot of stories, not telling you like the full detail of the aftermath. So it's up to you to figure out if this is going to be a good end or not for these characters. Also, Mau Mau's dad, bro, he is so smart. He's like the Batman. So he pieces together these mysteries even faster than Mau Mau. So that explains how Mau Mau gets like her deductive skills. It's from her dad. So her dad constantly tries to teach her about like, you know, different types of poisons, different effects they have on the body. And they're looking out for any clues, possible motives. So yeah, like Mau Mau's dad is even stronger than her. Mau Mau has to go back to the rear palace. So they do. It's kind of like funny seeing her come back and then Jinshi, he's devastated. He's like, Bro, you relied on this guy instead of me, and then, like, what did you do to pay him back? I made him have the best night of his life, or whatever, so Jinshi thinks that Mama fucked this dude as kind of a reward to go back to her home village. But Mama's just, like, so confused why Jinshi even cares. So I guess that's a bit interesting. It also reveals why Mama is so kind of ignorant, because she's like, Oh, I can't, like, ask Jinshi to take me outside because I have nothing to offer him, since he has no cock. So the story goes on. I really love these mysteries we're getting every episode and really love these character moments. They're all so funny. Okay, so for free run Beyond Journey's End episode 12, full episode kind of split into two parts. First part, they're kind of, like, navigating their way up north past the blizzard. Free run is super tired, so Stirk tries to carry her. But then Fern is like, bro, you're a pervert. <laughs> I kind of like feel bad for Stirk. Like, come on, bro. He's just trying to help out. And Fern, she doesn't really have like great communication skills. So yeah, she just loves picking on Stirk. Anyway, they go to their first destination. It's kind of like a place where the hero sword lives. And there seems to be a lot of monsters here. So Free Ren, she was supposed to come here like 50 years ago. And she kind of helps the village leader, who's like this little girl, which is kind of cute. She has Shika's voice actress. And then yeah, Free Ren kills all these monsters. We see why the monsters are attracted to this area because the hero sword is actually here the Excalibur or whatever and we get some lore with the old hero Himmel he had a fake sword he didn't really have the real sword and yeah that was like a lie that was like spread throughout the kingdom so yeah he can't really pull out the real sword but he kind of doesn't care he's not sad because he's like okay I don't really need a sword I can just be a fake hero and defeat the demon lord regardless Stark is kind of side eyeing the sword so yo maybe he pulls it out I don't think so maybe in like the far future but yeah they leave the village after they did their job and yeah they go to the next destination so it's Stark's birthday today and they finally get to stop by a town so then free run has a present for Stark it's the closed dissolving potion promise free run wants to pour it on Stirk, which is like not the correct thing to do. So Fern kind of like scolds Free Run and is like, bro, get him a better present. The thing is, Fern also doesn't know what to get him. So yeah, she kind of like spends time going around the city and also sees Stirk kind of like helping everybody out. So yeah, this dude Stirk is so cool. Just like spending his free time, just like being like a model citizen, helping people get cats out of trees. Fern kind of talks to Stirk. We get a bit more of like Stirk's backstory on how he never had a birthday present. So yeah, he was part of like this warrior family and everyone in his clan basically favored strength. He never really had any feats. He never defeated any monsters. So his parents kind of looked down on him. But we saw that his older brother actually cared for him so that was like kind of cool unexpected i was like i thought your older brother was gonna be an asshole and then anyway we go back they celebrate their birthday together free run kind of cooks him steak that's actually really sick like yo food protein for the birthday present yo i'll take that any day of the week she got the recipe from aizen who kind of did the same thing and fern also buys him a present i think it's like a jewelry piece or something like a bracelet so yeah i guess that's cool so yeah, the squad getting closer this adventure just feels so wholesome very cute okay so for arc knights perish and frost episode 8 yes this is the finale this anime is finished what a solid mobile game anime so yes this was the big frost nova fight she basically sacrifices herself to let her people escape which is kind of sad like you didn't even need to be here girl like you could have ran away first <laughs> But yeah, like she fights off with Rhodes Island's forces. It was like Blaze, Amia, Greythroat, and the Doctor. And yeah, she uses like her black ice. She's like singing. Everyone's like super frozen, can barely like go against her. Blaze has like kind of fire powers, so she can kind of hang with Frost Nova. But yeah, Frost Nova's kind of sacrificing herself. She's like, I'll join Rhodes Island if you can beat me. But she's literally like killing herself. So yeah, the fight is pretty one sided. Frost Nova's winning. 
But yeah, Amia, her like rings are kind of frozen as well, so she can't really use her arts. So yeah, she's about to kill everyone, but she dies at the last second, so everyone kind of like lives. But it's like sad that she died. So yeah, I mean it's a good fight overall. It showcased everyone, had like very solid animation, so yeah, I guess they were like saving the big moments for this fight. Overall though, there's some questions I had for this anime, like, why is this your team first of all? Where are the 6 stars that I rolled for? No, you pulled up with Greythroat and Blaze, that's it. Also, why did Frost Nova even have to be here? Like, all she accomplished here was saving Mephisto. Like, her whole Yeti squad died for no reason. Like, are, are you serious? Like, I guess we wrapped up her story that way, but yeah, she didn't even need to be here. But this season felt a bit disappointing compared to season 1, mainly because the story was, like, disjointed. Like, first we went to Chernabog, which was cool because, yeah, we met Frost Nova there. But after that, we instantly went to Lungman, transitioned there. We did some stuff in Lungman, which was fine, but then we went back to the Frost Nova fight. We saw the aftermath where Blaze came in, and, like, I really liked the character moments. Like, the Chen Hoshiguma episode was one of my favorites. But yeah, like, other episodes felt uneventful. There were, like, very short fight scenes lower quality episodes compared to like season one that's how it felt like for me but i mean it's still a good finale like i'm expecting a season three as well even though there's no announcement because you gotta wrap up the story you gotta show mephisto you gotta show off Tallulah and patriot like those are the ogs so i guess we gotta wait and see what their plans are because there's no season three announcement so it might take like two years or something however long anime production takes maybe they'll see from like the ratings merch sales if people like keep playing the game but overall yeah i was like entertained by this anime i didn't really have like super high expectations but i thought the first frost nova fight was like done very well her singing gave me shivers and her powers was like very devastating just like freezing everyone you get close to her you just like instantly get frostbite so yeah she's nothing to fuck around with overall though yeah i felt the storytelling the season was a bit disjointed i know that's like the same way the game is shaped out but i felt like it didn't work in this season so yeah it's a bit sad but hey what can you do this is still one of the more higher quality mobile games machia record is still one of my favorite mobile game animes so this doesn't really beat it probably just as good as fate babylonia i guess okay so for ragnar crimson episode 9 another fire episode we see the silverware princess She's in love with Ragna, bro. What? That's kind of crazy. <laughs> it's like something you don't really expect, right? This like badass strong princess. She literally grilled Crimson, kind of gave her the business. <laughs> But now she's like a whole different person. She's like an airheaded girl, like with her first crush. The silverware princess, she can see the shape and color of people's aura as well. And she can even see beyond that and see your character. So even if you can lie, she can just like see who you are as a person. And Crimson as a person is just like a bunch of like fucked up skulls and dead bodies. So yeah, Crimson really can't lie to this princess. And since she was about to die, she kind of accepts her death because she's immortal anyway. So she's like, I'll probably just like fake my death and hide out over here. So he kind of like deflects the silverware princess's sword. And now he's like trying to talk to her like, oh, yo, what did we do? <laughs> but yeah, when Starlia sees Ragna, she's like, oh shit, he's a muscular dude with a sword for a head. This is perfection. I've never seen anything like this. And yeah, I guess Ragna making his presence known in this like military base. So we realize what's happening, our new setting right now. So yeah, Ragna, he really wants to like defeat Ultimatia. But they teleported from the royal capital to this kind of like military base in the desert. Starlia kind of did this to protect her people because like there's like strong dragons kind of like hunting them down. We see a lot of like crazy new characters as well. They all follow Starlia. So yeah, she's like the big leader. And yeah, I guess it's cool seeing our cast kind of expanded. It's kind of scary though because anytime Ragnar and Crimson try to help people, a lot of people do die in the aftermath. So yeah, hopefully these characters are not led astray. And I guess we'll see what's going to happen. It's really funny seeing Starlia's reactions to everything. Also, after that, we get some big interesting thing so ultimatia she's kind of dreaming now since she like kind of got bodied in the last fight and now she sees that the god is kind of like crying for her or something she's like why'd you let me die so that's weird we saw the god is like kind of a little girl in ultimatia's head so that was like very strange as well like i think these dragons are kind of schizo like they're just making up this god but anyway like the big thing ultimatia when she wakes up she tries to use her powers zawardo she can't she can't stop time that's kind of crazy so maybe ragged like traumatized her so much maybe the god took away her power we don't know but yeah so wardo is finished okay so for dr stone new world part two episode seven so yeah bro yo fumbled the bag i got kind of mad because yeah last episode he shot abara shot his hand and then ibarra dropped the medusa so that was so sick my boy redeeming himself 
these characters are winning so happy i mean i expected there to be like kind of like a plot twist or something like ibarra kind of like getting control back because he is the main villain and we still have like half the anime remaining so yeah yo fumbled the bag because he didn't know how to use the beam and instead of hauling his ass the other way ibarra gets a chance to fall down go up to the beam and activate it so the way to activate it is to like call a distance and time and that kind of dictates the power of the beam so he kind of freezes yo takes up the medusa and now he tells like one of the strongest people in the village to run to the center of the island while he swallows the medusa so now the beam is going to be emitted inside of him and stun the whole island now this dude is hauling ass all the characters are trying to chase after him trying to stop him but no he like goes into the middle of the island it's kind of crazy <laughs> So yeah, everyone's frozen, but Chrome, he realizes that there's like a time frame for this beam to activate. So then he uses this calculation to kind of like tell everybody. So it seems like Senku's hatching a plan. So yeah, Ibarra controls the beam, freezes the whole island. He kind of retrieves the Medusa by smashing open the chest of the guy he gave it to. But now what? Everyone is frozen. So you're by yourself here, bro. But yeah, Senku is still alive. He had a way to counter the beam. It's just him and Ibarra in a 1v1. That's kind of cool. I was kind of a bit disappointed that Senku revealed him himself because i'm like bro this old man got claws he has hands like i don't know if you can fight him but yeah senku has this like kind of like electric box strapped up on him so maybe he'll beat ibarra and then he'll free everyone all right, so for Goblin Slayer Season 2, Episode 8, we're killing goblins. <laughs> what else is new? So yeah, we're basically in this like water reservoir area. And we gotta defeat all the goblins here to kind of like save the elf village. So yes, there's a shaman here. He's controlling the goblins, giving them orders. So yeah, we gotta beat the goblins. Everyone's kind of like gearing up, fighting them. We see like Goblin Slayer doing his thing. The priest is helping support. The lizard man kind of bodying people with his muscles. But yeah, the problem is that the shaman got hands as well. So he kind of like shoots out a poison cloud and stuns everybody. Now everyone's like super weakened. The goblins are jumping them. It's kind of like crazy. Goblin Slayer is getting stabbed. Everyone else is getting beaten up. Up. We see the archer getting her clothes ripped off, and then the priestess is scared. She gets flashbacks to the first episode. Like, bro, did we roll the dice incorrectly? No, everyone's gonna die. She kind of casts her purify miracle to offensively kill the goblin shaman. So it works, but then she feels a bit sad because it's like she did something blasphemous. It was a bit strange in the anime because, like, they didn't really explain what she did. That was bad. But, like, I guess if you use some, like, critical thinking, you could, like, tell that, like, she targeted a goblin with her spell. So, yeah, I guess you can't really kill people with your miracle that's against the goddess's teachings but it's also kind of weird because you know she could use solar flare on people but yeah she didn't really kill the shaman he's still alive so it looks like she turned his blood into water but he kind of like survived from that but yeah i mean i saw like people disappointed in this like scene because it looked like they cut off some explanations but it is what it is you know just another goblin fight here seeing the elf sister get married and now you know everything works out they almost got a well-deserved vacation but yeah they ended up fighting goblins again okay so for tier moon empire episode 8 Mia, she's solving all the issues, bro. She's doing it. This episode is no different. So yeah, she kind of like solves the problem with the Lulu tribe, who's kind of like the people that like respect the forest. So she kind of asks Dion, who's like the soldier guy, to like accompany her to find a hairpin. He realizes that Mia has some ulterior motive, like maybe she wants to like negotiate peace with the people. But then yeah, Mia has no ulterior motive, bro. She just wants her hairpin. So yeah, this kind of like causes a big incident because the Lulu tribe kind of corner Mia and Dion in the forest. <laughs> So now she has to like kind of talk her way out of this or it's going to be a big incident, a big war. So basically she sees one of the maids from her school that kind of like vouches for her. So then he kind of regrets this. So I guess he's happy that he can like see the hairpin again. So yeah, Mio kind of sweet talks her way out of an incident. And now she kind of like maintains friendly relationships with the people in the forest. So I guess that's kind of cool, but it's not over there. Mio, she kind of like claims the forest for herself. So with the other aristocrats that own the forest, it's now Mia's land. So we even see Mia's dad who's also like supporting her. So yeah. I guess he loves Mia. I wonder what happened to him while well, his daughter was getting guillotined. Maybe he also got murdered too. But yeah, basically we solve all the problems there. Mia also sees that Tiona, she's like her kind of nemesis. He, she has a little brother who's like making synthetic wheat. So yeah, he's like very smart. But thing is, he can't afford to go to the Royal Academy. So Mia's like, instead of kind of loaning you money to go, why not I make a school for you and all the other people that can't like afford noble schooling? So yeah, Mia's kind of succeeding and her diary kind of disappears. Maybe because like, yeah, she avoided this future. Maybe she won't die anymore. But we see that there's evil people plotting in the background. So they were kind of working to sabotage Mia's kingdom. But now like since Mia fixed everything, they kind of give up. So maybe they have a different target in mind. Maybe another kingdom. So yeah, I guess Mia might have to save people 
but the fact that her diary disappeared now everything in the future is kind of shaky like what is mia gonna do now she can't really rest easy because yeah evil people are still like around so yeah i guess we reach a new point in the story i wonder what's gonna happen all right so for eminence and shadow season two episode eight another fan service episode it is the hot springs oh uh, it's kind of cool so yeah we reach like this dragon water hot springs kind of funny so yeah, it's run by like the shadow girls they open it up a new business venture so yes the problem is we see uh, two of shadow's classmates it's like the two dudes that brag about being virgins they they want to go and then they see shadow has tickets he has six tickets in his room and the girls of shadow garden realize this is a plan from shadow he wants to invite three of us to like kind of have a group date with two of these guys and shadow himself so all the girls want to go but yeah there's too many of them they have to limit to three people so all the main seven shadow girls kind of play rock paper scissors to decide who gets to go with the classmates and shadow and yeah the winners are kind of cool because yeah it's like people that weren't really shown off in season one so it's seda and then i think it's delta and beta so yeah the wolf girl she's <laughs> delta's just like doing everything bro delta sweep and then yeah beta she's like the white haired so yeah they're all doing their thing but yeah shadow does not show up in this episode <laughs> So yeah, I don't know where he is, but yeah, I, the girls kind of realized that Shadow kind of like did this vacation thing as a cooldown for their hard work. So yeah, they're all rewarded. They get to chill and relax. And yeah, I guess there's no deeper meaning to it. But yeah, we see that like there's like a rumor in this like hot springs thing where there's like dragon tears kind of like trapping a dragon in here. And the only way to wake him up is using princess tears. So they kind of get Beta to cry by like kind of roasting her. <laughs> He's like, oh no, am I not good enough? And then yeah, her tears kind of wake up the dragon and free him. We see all the other kind of shadow members we're trying to fight off the dragon and they eventually like kind of free him there's like random wholesome plot in this fan service episode but yeah i really liked it okay so for i'm in love with the villainous episode eight so yeah, this anime is kind of crazy i haven't really talked about it too much but it does like talk about a lot of like serious issues i think one of the big ones a lot of people know that got popular was them like talking about like being gay and how it's like not really a choice it's just like who you are so yeah, i guess that was kind of interesting this one actually covers incest which is a bit unexpected but yeah we see like there's like kind of like this plot in the school basically it's kind of funny them like talking about serious shit and then ray basically like kind of sexually assaulting the villainous girls so it's kind of like a big dissonance and like the serious like plot moments but yeah after that there's also something serious where just like a proxy war between the nobles and the poor people they're not equal at the academy so there's like a lot of like fighting going on a lot of stuff in the media and then one of the nobles actually burns one of the common people but yeah we realized that this like fight between the classes it's like done by a higher up power it's done by the church that's so kind of crazy we're talking about proxy wars here in this anime by a ray taylor since she knows like what happens like the storyline so she kind of stops one of the guys from like you know summoning monsters but the problem is that he has a sister and his sister is actually claire's maid so they have like this incest relationship the brother and sister and then yeah they're being manipulated it's kind of crazy like what the hell so yeah we'll see what's gonna happen but yeah i think like it's kind of serious now because ray's realizes that this kind of diverges from the main story plot so yeah i guess monsters are attacking the school and a fight between the nobles and commoners and then the church being evil it's all there so yeah a lot of like serious topics in this anime it's kind of crazy okay so for our dating story episode eight yeah kind of cute episode so, so like the squad they play laser tag together and yeah they're wearing like kind of waifu army clothes <laughs> trying to like shoot each other so yeah, it's kind of like a group date between ryoto and his friends and then runa and her friends so i guess that's kind of cute seeing more characters do their thing like you know it's like a classic romance thing have like the extended cast talk to each other sometimes so yeah they continue their date they go on a ferris wheel they kiss so yeah after all of that we still see karose kind of like causing trouble <laughs> so they kind of want to be her friend though right ryoto and runa they have a plan so yeah, I, I mean, Ryuta, why are you still avoiding her? Maybe try to, like, talk things out. But yeah, I guess, like, people, they're looking for, like, kind of, like, leaders for the culture festival for the class. So yeah, I guess this gives them a chance to kind of hash things out, the two sisters, to talk it out. So yeah, I guess the plot goes on, you know, the cool, wholesome dates are happening. Ryoto and Runa, their relationship is getting stronger every episode. Very cute and wholesome. And yeah, that is it for the animes this week. Thank you for watching. Please let me know what your favorite shows were. But yeah, these stories are escalating. A lot of cool plot moments, getting very exciting. So yeah, I can't wait to see what these animes got for us next week.